talking about one of the greatest privileges, advantages that there is to being a Christian, and that is you now have somebody that always does things together for your good. Amen. I think it was Justin that just said you don't always understand it. No, that's what faith's about. But when you have that faith confirmed by sight, when you get to heaven, it'll make sense then. But you can't make sense of it down here. It requires faith. You know, if the Bible's right, in the last days, there'll be an epidemic of people that leave and go to the far country. They don't have to have necessarily an excuse. And Elijah certainly didn't when he got depressed. Moses, when he got discouraged... Paul actually lost his eyesight when he made a decision to follow the Lord and decided to go down to the street called Straight. And momentarily went a little bit rogue when he was trained at the feet of Agabus and then they told him to go, not to go to Israel or Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going. And the Lord said, don't go. And he said, I'm going anyway. And he even found a biblical grounds, he thought, for being disobedient. In the Bible, we often find what we're looking for Peter denied the Lord and decided that he would go fishing and Mephibosheth fell down and had somebody else fall on them and because of the destruction of someone else found reason not to be in the palace where he belonged to be. Have you ever wondered about Mephibosheth and asked yourself, why didn't he go back and say, hey, wait a minute, I, I mean, a nurse took me out. I didn't know any better. And she fell and I got crippled, but why you, you have a problem with me? But he had heard what everybody else said. And he believed what everybody else said. Yes. And he wasn't in the palace because of what everybody else said. Amen. Because somebody else fell on him. David made a mess with Bathsheba. We know that the baby died and David had his moments. I understand John Mark had a problem because he had dissension. I, I guess what I'm trying to say with the Apostle Paul, it is that in the last days, if you're looking for a reason to get out, there are more of them than there are to stay in. Yes, Amen. Amen. The spirit of the far country is crying to people that are in the church today to say, get out, get out. And the Lord wants you to stay in, but the devil wants you to get out. Would you like, if you would, please take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter number 15. I wrote down six C's that I think may be beneficial to you. You're kind of pulled out of James chapter number 1. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God, for God doesn't tempt a man to do evil. A man is drawn away when he is drawn away of his own lusts. Courtship eventually leads to consent. Consent leads to conception. Conception leads to consummation. An old preacher named Bob Jones Sr. said, A thought encourages a deed. A deed produces eventually a habit. A habit is turned into your character, and your character determines your final destination. It does matter where I go. And who I hang out with. Yes, Amen. If the Bible's right, in 1 Timothy 4, he said, In the last days, many shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and many shall depart from the faith. Luke chapter 15, we find a, an unbelievably familiar story, probably one of the literary cl classics that's ever been written. Something that even people who aren't even Christians, they refer to on a regular basis because of what they call the prose, the form in which it's written in. It's just a really good story. With words on a page, it paints pictures in your mind. And here's a man, the Bible says, who has two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divideth unto them as living not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance on riotous, with riotous living. 
And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain, desired, wanted to, wished to have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. Brother Larry, pray for us, would you please? And ask God to give us some help. Amen. I wrote down some questions about the prodigal because the Bible doesn't say why he left. It just said he left. That leaves a lot of supposition on our parts and oftentimes the Bible doesn't give specific names or even reasons why so that we can include ourselves in the passage and maybe read ourselves into the passage that would allow us to apply maybe even an Old Testament passage to something that's occurring in our life. If we're honest, we can find ourselves generally in those two brothers at some time or another in our Christian life. Both the one that left the house and the prodigal that stayed in the house. Both the one who did and acted upon what he was thinking and the one that thought about it but never did it, but nonetheless was upset when one got right because he never got right. That elder brother should have been rejoicing that the younger brother returned. But instead it bothered him because the elder brother wasn't really in line with the father. We know that because of the conclusion of the story. He says, the servant says to the elder brother, Listen, can't you be happy because the father's happy? Can I touch this for just a second? That too often we have ought against our brother. We don't really care if it bothers the Father, because it bothers us. And that person you have ought against will be the one that'll be at the altar during the singing or something. And man, it'll just, it's like, oh yeah, well, about time. Yeah, look how spiritual they think they are. Everybody thinks they're so wonderful. But you know what they did to me? And the Lord's like, hey, can you just be happy that they're getting right with me? Or is it really all about the selfish narcissist that lives in the house who's the prodigal that never left. A prodigal just means a spendthrift, a person that is all about themselves. Anything they get, they use for the furtherance of whatever they want for pleasure. I taught you last week in the book of James, Daron, good to see you. I taught you last week in the book of James that in chapter number 4 and verse number 1 that there are certain people that take great pleasure out of just fighting and arguing, not just with themselves but with other people. I showed you how that's a a lustful, a a, a physical desire that you never satiated or satisfied unless you're fighting with somebody. Always looking for somebody to fight with. Hopefully not your husband or your wife, but some people cannot have life without drama. If there's not any drama, they will create their own play. They're always looking for 
somebody somewhere to say something so that they can go, Oh my God! Can you believe? Uh, yeah, no, I can't believe that you're that jacked up about something that's not even involving you. But the involvement comes when they, at the end of this story, the elder brother takes the spotlight that should be on the father. The hero in the story is not the prodigal. I'm not going to reward the prodigal for going out into the far country, wasting his inheritance on riotous living, and then having enough sense to go, what an idiot, I'm coming back to the house. That's a great story, but the hero in the story is the father for letting him come back. Hero in the in the story is the one that didn't disinherit his boy because he was always his boy. He never condoned his sin by going there, but when the boy was ready to come back, he made a way. And at the same time, we don't recognize that the elder brother also seems to rise up inside us because once we start doing right, it's like, why ain't Mary here? I'm out in the kitchen doing everything. Why ain't Mary here? Right? You know, the story of Mary and Martha. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. And instead the Lord's like, well, why do you care? I'm happy because Mary's with me. She chose the better part. Yes. Yes. Now, Martha, if you want me to like you like I do Mary, then why don't you take Mary's position? Oh, no, Martha, you would never sit down at my feet long enough for me to teach you anything. You know, teenagers are a lot like that. You can't tell them anything because they know everything. And before you old people start nodding your head and going, Amen, that's right, you were the same way. Yes. 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 The smartest that teenager will ever get is from 13 to 19. <laughs> and then after 19, they're like, what an idiot. But until then, as the older I get, the more I realize my dad was really smart and man, was he gracious. But we all come to that point in life. Well, this teenager, I don't know, was he tired of the routine? The rules, the regulations, the, the cleanliness of the house. I mean, what, 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 what did he miss out there? He had food, he had clothing, it was entitled to an inheritance. And, and I don't know, what, what was missing? The Bible doesn't say. The Bible just simply said that he took all of his substance and he went to the far country. Why would he dishonor his father and dispose of the things that God had provided through his father for him? Why would he be deceived into thinking that life was greener or the passage was greener, not understanding that it is always greener over the septic tank? Yep. 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 But what was it that caused him to say, I'm living for the here and now, I'm living for the right now, and I want whatever's coming to me, I'm headed out of here. You know one of the sad things in the story that many people miss, not that I'm the poster child for picking up things no other, nobody else does, it reminds me of the story of Jacob. You know, when Jacob left after Esau, I mean, he goes over there and crosses the river. He gets over there at a place called Bethel. He even makes a, a, a stone, a pillow. I mean, he must be right with God. If you can make a rock feel like a pillow, you must really have something going on for you. And he goes to sleep, and while he's sleeping, he sees a ladder with angels ascending and descending, and he gets to talk to God, and he just messed up and stole an Abrahamic blessing. It almost looked like I'm leaving. It must be right because, look, God's blessing me. That happened with Jacob. And Jacob spent years out of fellowship with God until one day he started back going to Esau. And then the Lord said, okay, it's time to have a come to Jesus meeting. Yes. If you're going to come back, it's more than just coming back from over there where you got your wife over on the wrong side of the river and all that. It's more than just a reunion with Esau. It's now you're going to come back to Bethel where I first met with you and we got to get some things straight. What's your name? Why do you ask me that? Because there's a lot in a name. Well, what is your name? My name's Jacob. What does that name mean, Jacob? It means, uh, you know, uh, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit conniving. A little bit conniving? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit of a trickster. I'm a, I'm a little bit of, what else are you? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a liar. Yes. I'm a thief. I'm a deceiver. I'm a supplanter. And the Lord said, we're starting to get somewhere now. Sometimes people don't want to come back because they don't want to be called out. 
what I like about the prodigal, in spite of the fact that he has a lot of things wrong with him, at least he kept his word. He said, give me, and he took it. He only took his portion. He took his mess to the far country. I like that. He didn't put it on social media. He said, I'm leaving. I'm not going to keep it in the house like some of you. You got the filth of the far country in your house. What's sad is even your kids know you have the filth of the far country in your house. We're not praying yet. We're getting there, but just hang on. I like the fact that when he said he was going, he went. You know what else I like? I like that when he said he came to himself, he got up and said, I'm going to go back to the Father's house. He got up and went. He didn't talk about it. I'm going to go. I'm, I am. I'm, I'm eventually going to go. I'm going to go. I'm gonna. He said, I'm going. I'm going. And he went. You know what else I like? I like the fact that he already made a plan for when he got there, what he was going to do. I have sinned against heaven and against you. It's my fault. I'm bad. Doesn't say in the passage that the father ever sinned or didn't sin. Doesn't say. Doesn't even magnify the sins of the elder brother. He doesn't come back and say, but daddy, if you just knew the problems, my brother used to beat me up and my brother used to talk about me and you gave all the emphasis to my brother. There was never any way out of it. I was on the wrong side of the bed there and my brother was going to get two thirds and I was only going to get a third and it was a bad situation. And if it hadn't been for the environment, the family and all that kind of stuff, you know, daddy, if you'd have treated me differently, he didn't say that. You know what he said? I've sinned. Right. Right. I like that. You say what? He got up to go back, but he already determined what he was going to say when he got there. He went back saying, I'm not worthy to be a son. I'm not entitled to what I threw away. But could I just be a servant? Could I just, I mean, could, could I just work for my food? He would be the guy with the sign that said, we'll work for food. Standing on the side of the road, only he would walk into the father's house and there would be that servant and he would say, hey, and you say, oh man, the old man's son's home. Boy, the boss man's son's home. Man, the father's son is home. Boy, this is a great blessing. He's like, no, I'm not even worried. They don't even refer to me as a son. I'm not entitled to that title. I'm not entitled to what that title brings me. I blew it. I messed it up. I was wrong. I don't deserve that. Man, before he can even talk to the servant, the father comes around there and throws it around. He said, wait, 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 daddy. Hold on. <laughs> I've sinned against. And the daddy said, man, that's all I've been wanting to hear. See, because it wasn't just a geographical location. Yeah. It was a mindset. Yeah. Can I say this first and foremost about the prodigal? He desired to have fellowship with the father. If he didn't, he wouldn't have gone back. Can I say that we learn by extracting, extruding from the passage, pulling out from the passage, we learn that the elder brother is not concerned about the father at all, which magnifies the concern of the younger of the two. Because it's not brought out, because you can definitely tell the younger brother wanted to make the father happy. He came back and said, listen, I don't even deserve it. I recognize what you've done. Could I say some things about the gratitude of the prodigal? Sure, I'm glad to have a place to come home to Amen. and a father that loves me. Amen. And I'm not coming back for anything that I might get out of it. I am poor, I am broken, and I am broke. I got nothing. I come back and my clothing that was at one time looked like the clothing of a rich man's apparel. My shoes are gone. My hair is a mess. I am unkept. I'm untrimmed. Everything about me screams and hollers, indigent, outcast, worthless, sorry, no good, rotten. No one would even recognize the heritage that I came from. So I have nothing to offer you and I'm not here because my situation is so bad that I know that I'm going to pull that political string now and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to say, well, hey, I don't have any other choice. I'm coming home so I can at least get something to eat and clothes to wear and a place to sleep and all that. No, I'm coming home to tell daddy I was wrong. Amen. Amen. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking to work for my food. You say, no, no, he's coming for a handout because the Bible said even his servants have bread enough to eat. No, 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 no. Did you see what his statement was? I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Let me be as one of those hired what? I'm willing to work. Let me. In other words, I know the bread don't come free. But daddy, I recognized I used to have it for free. Because I was your kid. And you used to put it on the table for me. 
and I didn't do anything to deserve it. Don't get in your mindset that the prodigal is like many people in today's world that say, well, I don't have any choice. I just will go back and, and take the charitable handout because I'm starving to death and I'm going to die if I don't. So I'll go back and play whatever game I got to play just to be back in the Father's house. It beats the fire out of the pig pen as I've heard preached before. I've heard preached before the Father's house is much better than the pig pen. Well, who doesn't know that? Nonetheless, people still leave the Father's house and go to the pig pen. I admire the prodigal. Not at all because he left. Because it's easy to leave, but it is hard to come back. You see what he had to do? He had to build a bridge over his pride. But when God deals with you, you know what happens. It isn't long before you're willing to walk under that bridge. You don't care about your pride. You realize, man... This is all on me. Yes, I'm not exalting the prodigal except to say, I wish I had his courage when it came to him recognizing the Bible said he came to himself. Amen. You know what he recognized? He recognized the only reason I left was because I allowed myself to get lifted up higher than it ought to be. Yes, Pride got in my way. Amen. I wasn't getting what I thought I deserved. And so I said, give me the portion that falleth to me. Early inheritance, I'm going to go blow it, doing what I want to do. Lord gave it to him. It's a picture of a Christian. Let me just kind of cut to the chase here so as not to keep you too long. Don't worry, I'm not fixing to end. I'm just going <laughs> to... It's a picture of a Christian. And what the Christian says is, is that rather than be in fellowship with the Lord and deal with all the stuff that goes with being in church and reading my Bible and praying and, and doing the things that God would have me to do, I want my inheritance now. I don't care about the gold, silver, and the precious stone in eternity. He loses his vision for the long term. Instead, he wants a short-term satisfaction. He hasn't laid up anything for where he's going to be when he winds up on the other side. It's a picture of a Christian who lives his life for this world, for this life, for the here and now, and decides, you know what? I don't, I don't really care about eternal things. I don't care about gold, silver, and precious stone. I heard a preacher stand up one time. He's a charismatic preacher. He's the guy that blows on people and, and they fall over. He swings his coat and they die. They fall over dead, you know, or fall over and, and that kind of a thing. And, you know, and I, I, I've yet to get my mind around all of that kind of a deal. He must have a lot of trained monkeys or, or whatever, but he walks up and he doesn't even touch them. He just points and they, poof, they fall over and, and things like that. And it's funny that charismatics can outdo Baptists all the time because they're willing to make a fool of themselves to act like they got the Holy Ghost or whatever. But you know what he said? He made a really stupid statement. You know what he said? He said, you shouldn't be judging him. Okay, well, I'm going to judge him. You don't have to, okay? You don't, you don't pay no attention to it at all. To judge is not what you think it is. To judge is to consider, to ponder, to contrast, to think before you act. It's not demeaning. It's not putting somebody down. I know I can't make any headway with anybody when they walk up. Hey, how are you doing? My name's John. Don't judge me. Well, you just judge me because you think I'm going to judge you. <laughs> so fair for the goose, fair for the gander. But at any rate, you know what he said? He said this. He said, listen, I hear all this talk about gold streets and gates of pearl, walls of jasper, and I hear all about this gold, silver, and precious stones. That's something they call the bema. I never called it a bema. That's on the bottom of a toilet. <laughs> Are you a plumber? You're a plumber. What do you have? You don't have a little white thing that sits on there? Doesn't it say B-E-M-A? Now I know what the Bema seat is. It's a toilet seat. <laughs> That's a fancy Greek word to make you think it's a, a place of judgment. That's why he calls it a judgment seat. Yeah. Bema seat. At the Bema. You know what he said? I don't want to wait till I get there. I want my gold now. Give me the portion that belongs to me now. I want my health now. I want my wealth now. I want my recognition and fame now. The Lord said, okay. 
If that's what you want, you can have it. You see how that rubs against modern theology? Our own flesh is kind of screaming right now. Well, now wait a minute, preacher. You know, let's be reasonable. Okay. But you can't be spiritual and be reasonable all the time. <laughs> spiritual man or a woman thinks about how it's going to play out in eternity long before they think about how it's going to play out down on the earth. That's why the Lord sees fit to put not just him as an illustration, but all the other ones I gave you, and there are many more to follow, that one of the things he says is, is that, listen, this individual, though it is a Jew and talking about things to the Jew, we can make a practical application and imprint that illustration, that example, to Christians who say, I'm saved, that's enough for me. Now I want to work, be, and do what I want to do. And when I get done with all of that, if there's anything left over, then fine. And if not, I'm good. I want my inheritance now. And you get up to heaven and the rest of eternity, you're a pauper. And the reason you're a pauper is, is because the Lord said, you said you wanted it now. I'm not saying to not have makes you spiritual and I'm not saying to have makes you spiritual. I'm saying it's a mindset, ladies and gentlemen, that when we come to the Lord, oftentimes we are very much like the prodigal who decides to live more in the far country than in the Father's house. We spend more time trying to please the people in the far country than we do trying to please the Father in the house. Why? I'm tired of the routine. I'm tired of the rut. I'm tired of the rigors. I'm tired of the religion. I'm tired of all of these regulations and all these things that are telling me I should or I shouldn't and all that. I'm, done. I'm going out. I'm going to do what I want to do. I ain't having nobody tell me anything. And the Lord said, oh, okay. This is why it's difficult for some of you to understand, but I don't try to force or push people into serving the Lord. Amen. Not my call to make. Amen. I can tell you it's the greatest thing you'd ever want to do. Yes, amen. I can tell you if the Lord sees fit to take a dirty rag like me and you and put you in his back pocket, that's a great thing, even if all he does is wipe an oil stick off with it. Amen. It's a great blessing, man. It's cool. But if you don't want to, the Lord's like, hey, you don't want to be here, no problem. Amen. See you later. And he makes friends with the world. And he's successful in the world, just like Moses was successful in Midian for 40 years. 40 years, Moses had a couple kids. By the time he's there, them kids are grown men. 40 years, he is the second in charge. And as soon as the old father-in-law kicks off, he's going to be the main priest in Midian. He's got what looks to be a pretty good wife. She stuck with him. Got all of his own herds as well as the father-in-law's herds. And a bush catches on fire. Moses says, well, that's kind of unusual to see a bush catch on fire. Not that the bush was burning, but that it wasn't consumed. And he said, you know something? Maybe it's time for me to get off of the road I'm walking on and turn aside and see. And the first thing that he does, the first thing the Lord says after he's been out of fellowship with him was a statement you've heard me tell you many times before. He said, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes because the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. That's my ground. That's the Father's house. You're not going to be in my house walking on my floors with Egypt's shoes on. The shoes of the far country, Moses, Midian or wherever, don't work on holy ground. By the way, that's Sinai. By the way, that's the beginning of the path of the second advent. By the way, that's all the way over there where everything began and you think is now ending, but it's just beginning to begin again. By the way, over in that area over there is one of the most drug-rich environments you've ever seen. It's more than just the beginning of civilization. It's a golden triangle because that's where the dope comes from. Nobody messes with that, but wars have been fought over it. 
And he said, that's my ground. And everybody that's ever tried to be on that ground that told God not that, that God wasn't allowed, you know what he did? He killed them and stacked them up like cordwood. And that ground is covered with blood. You say, why? Because God's not done yet. But that's another story. Moses, you've been gone 40 years, boy. You ready to come home? I don't know, Lord. I'm, I thought you were blessing me. Really? Well, yeah, I mean, I left Egypt. You let me escape persecution. Matter of fact, the, the one that was the Pharaoh over there is dead now, so I'm statute of limitations. Even though it's for murder, I don't have to worry about it anymore. He ain't going to come get me. Right? Yes. I met a woman over here. I fit in real good over here. You fit in good over here, do you, Moses? Moses, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir, now that you've taken your shoes off. Now that we're having a talk. You say, why? Because <clears throat> when you're barefooted, you can't run away quite as fast. Moses, you put them shoes on a long time ago so you could run from what I wanted you to do. I ask you a question, Moses. Yes, sir. Lord, help yourself. Go ahead and ask you. You fit in over here real well, do you? Yeah, he said, let me ask you a question. You think that might be because you never told him you were a Hebrew? Moses says, well, well, I mean, well, 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 hold on, hold on just a minute. And Moses, remember, he had speech impediment. He says, well, what's the matter, Moses? Cat got your tongue? Or is that your wife? Lord, if she knew I was a Hebrew, man, I'd be making a bed out of a couch. I just thought you wanted to come home, Moses. You know how I know that's true? Gershom's Moses is oldest boy, and when Gershom was born, Moses was supposed to circumcise that boy. And because he didn't, one day the Lord shows up, and they're getting ready to go back over to Egypt, and the Lord shows up, and he appears to Zipporah, and he says to Zipporah, he said, uh, your husband won't tell you, so I'm going to tell you. And she said, what's that? He said, I'm fixing to kill your boy. She said, what do you want to kill my boy for? He said, because he hadn't been circumcised. Your husband was supposed to have done that. He's a Hebrew. And she said, excuse me. He's a what? He looks like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He acts like an Egyptian. He told me he was from Egypt. He said, well, she said, well, he got one part of it, it's true. <laughs> he is from Egypt. But he's a transplant. He's like a Palestinian who thinks they own Canaan. Right. He don't get to possess my land. You know how I know? She comes in there. She does what he should have done. And she discards some of that stuff there in front of Moses. You know what she says to him? Thou art a bloody man, you lying, stinking, rotten, been living with me for 40 years and never told me who you were. No testimony at all in the far country. Not one word at all that the prodigal ever told anybody about yeah. daddy's house. That's it. Yeah. That's it. You say, how do you know you're in the far country? You quit talking about the house. Yeah. Don't talk about home no more. Don't talk about heaven no more. Don't talk about eternity no more. Don't talk about how good God was to save you. Oh, well, unless it facilitates what it is you're wanting to get done. And Zipporah comes in and says, you jackleg you. You pinhead. You're going to let my boy die because you wouldn't tell me you were a Hebrew from the beginning. Why you been acting like the world, Moses? Now I hear you're some great deliverer. You're going to go deliver the children of Israel, turn into Charlton Heston in the next couple weeks. <laughs> Moses says, yeah, about that. I've been running for 40 years. But he was successful. Doesn't look like he was under conviction. Doesn't look like it bothered him at all. You know what I heard a homicide detective say one time? He said, you know how they say that 
Time heals all wounds. He said, time also soothes consciences. He said, after a while, they forget the details of what they did and, and, they, and it doesn't bother them anymore. And then after a while, it goes from being convicted by it. And then all of a sudden, they begin to justify it. And then before long, it's like, yeah, what's the big deal? Yep. And I thought, well, that's probably true for Christians. They get accustomed to living in the far country and don't even get under conviction anymore. It's not because the Lord's not telling us. It's just kind of like whatever. You know, there's a couple of things that they tried to take away from you when you started into school. And one of those things was to take away a guilt complex because it's, you're not supposed to feel guilty about anything. Well, that ain't true. You should feel guilty about doing wrong. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. Being convicted, that's a good thing. Yeah. Moses, not so much. Forty years, he's comfortable. You know, I'm pretty sure Moses planned on retiring right there. He was going to be the big cheese over there, however long he was going to live. I'm sure he planned, I'm going to be here. I got it all planned out. I got my sheep herds. I got my boys. They can take over the family business. And I got everything taken care of. And the Lord said, Moses. But he calls him a second time because he says, Moses, I'm not talking to Israel and I'm not talking to your wife. I'm not talking to your kids. I'm talking to you. Listen to me. Amen. I think he called him twice because he said to him, this is going to be the last chance. Moses goes back to the house. And the poor says, what in the cat hair did you do with your shoes? He said, I, I left them to remind me. The places I used to go, I can't go anymore. Amen. You know what I used those shoes for? To protect my feet from walking on rocky paths and burning ground and snake-riddled uh, wilderness areas. I, I used those shoes to take me away from God instead of to God. I... I think, and I, I probably have to go find it in the original Hebrew manuscript, but I think he probably said, I will arise and I'm going to my father's house. You're going back to Egypt? You're going to leave us? Yep. Now you can come with me, but I'm going. Don't think there wasn't a family squabble. Forty years he had intertwined himself with the people of Midian, not Hebrews. Forty years he had intertwined and been set up as the only male counterpart that remained for the Midianitish priest that was Zipporah's daddy. Forty years setting up, you're going to be the man. Going to my father's house. Man, you talk about a rough deal. Yeah, but can't live here no more. The truth's out. I'm going home. How do you call Egypt your home? It's where I was born. <laughs> Y'all didn't know this, but I was a basket case. <laughs> they had me float down the river with alligators and snakes, the same river that they threw a whole bunch of them in and killed them. I floated above that. Amen. And I bumped into the princess. And when she lifted the lid, the Lord nudged me and I started crying and it was love at first sight. She fell in love with me. And the way the Lord fixed it was my mama happened to be over in the bushes. My sister, and she was watching and said, do you know somebody that can help me raise this kid? And she says, matter of fact, I do. She said, he said so I was raised in the palace, but I was raised by my mama. <clears throat> Amram and jockey bed. You think you've got funny names today? <laughs> I hear people talk about names all the time. It's kind of like, well, they're naming them so-and-so and so-and-so. -so -and -so -and -so. Amram and jockey bed. And they raised Moses. And he understood his heritage. He tried to take matters into his own hands because he wanted to do it his way instead of God's way. And when God didn't let him be the deliverer when Moses put him in the box, Moses said, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Don't be fooled by success to think that because of success that God's winking at 
your sin. Don't ever take his kindness, his long-suffering, and his generosity as condonement for you mingling with the Midianites. It's interesting, a little bit later on, when Moses leads the people out, guess who's on the list of people to be destroyed? Midianites, Jebusites, Perizzites, Kenites. You say, wow, the Lord said, those people worship the wrong God. And what I know is, is that if you don't eradicate them, they're going to pull you in with them. Yes. Well, how do we know that? The same way with the prodigal. You know what it said? He joined himself to yes. the people of that country. And they said, we got a job for you. Feed our pigs. You know what he wound up doing? He wound up carrying water for the world. I know. This is definitely not modern day Christianity. Modern day Christianity says, no, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. Well, now hold on a minute. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Amen. The lust of the flesh, the pride of the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you love the, the world, the love of the Father is not in you. James chapter number 4 teaches you that if you love the world, you're at enmity with God and friendship with the world makes you the enemy of God. Yeah. Right. Amen. Now, preacher, dispensationally, that's in the tribulation period. Oh, okay, go ahead. You can't quit being a son. Figure it out any way you want to, prodigal. You got it all worked out how you can play be both sides of the world. This past weekend, I had the privilege of talking to a bajillion young people. Churches came from all over and filled up the building. It's not about the size of the meeting, but the Lord didn't lead me down the pathway of salvation. He led me down the pathway towards surrender and being sold out. And I preached a message to the young people that used to be a very, very prevalent message when we would go to camp. We would try to encourage young men and one women to, young women to surrender their lives and sell out to Jesus Christ at an early age. You preach that message now, and they think you're trying to get kids to join a cult. Because you would rather them complete college and be all-star athletes and have a 4.0 and graduate from college than serve Jesus. Serve Jesus if you can't do nothing else. Or when you don't have nothing else to do. That's just the truth of the church. And I'm encouraging these kids. I'm sure, man, some of them parents were probably cringing like, wait, whoa. A few years ago now, a preacher came to me after service. We had a little meeting with the young people, and then we took the young men to this meeting, and we took them in. They wanted me to talk to them about being called and different things like that. And so I just gave them a few things out of Romans and this and that and the other, and at the end of that, I didn't give an invitation. At the end of that, a couple of kids are coming down there and this boy's bawling, man. And his daddy came down there and talked to him and I knew who his daddy was. He's a preacher, he's a pastor. and So I thought, okay, well, good, whatever, he's getting right. It's not always repentance. Sometimes it's gratitude. You don't know what somebody's doing down there. You, you, people are getting up during the song service, you know, what are they doing? I got no idea. They, they're repenting of their sin, you know. Well, maybe, but maybe they're going down there to say, Lord, I just want you to know I love you. I mean, good to put your love on the altar. Lord, I just want you to know I love you. You know, I mean, that's a good thing. See big old bulls, grown men going to the altar. That's a blessing, man. And so they get up and go. And then a little bit later on, a preacher asked me, he said, can I talk to you for a minute in between the morning and the evening service? I said, sure, man, what's up? He said, uh, one of the guys that brought some kids here is a little bit upset. I said, okay. You know, what I do now, I don't, I don't know. An illustration I used or said something. You know, back in those days, sometimes I said stuff that, I need to learn to get that under control. And I'm working on it. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. And I said, okay, well, what did I say? He said, you made the statement along the idea of encouraging young men and women to surrender to Jesus Christ and sell out now. I said, okay. And he said, He's upset because his son told him he was going to go to Bible school instead of college. I said, why is that my fault? 
I mean, that, I mean, that's what he, you know what I was told he said? Brother Peacock can be overly persuasive at times with his words. And you are caught up in emotion right now. And you, you need to, he was a preacher, that was his son. So I, I said, I don't know what to tell you. I don't believe I told him wrong. I don't believe it's for everybody. I said, I believe he can surrender his life and still go to college. Sure. I've known people that have surrendered their life, finished college, then go to Bible school and then do whatever. Yeah. Some of them build buildings. Yeah. Sure. I'm called to preach. Preaching pretty loud right now. <laughs> Two stories out there. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I don't know what that... But, but here's the concept. Preacher, we got it all worked out. This is how it ought to be for our kids. And we get this all fixed. Don't you come in with no Jesus stuff and mix it up. Don't come in here and tell the prodigal not to go to the far country to save himself the trip. Now, preacher, we don't want our kids involved in drugs and drinking and sex and promiscuity. But Lord, have mercy on my soul, preacher. They got to be real because they got to live in the world. They got to make a living. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm a preacher there. You talk them out of it because I'm not going to quit telling them that that's the best thing they could ever do. Amen. Here's what I said this weekend. I said, just suppose you were to die next week and you were going to make that commitment, but you chose instead... I will, but first. Here's my illustrations. If I'm going to be financially secure and have real estate, I can't follow Jesus now until I get my job. I'm in Luke 9. And the Lord kept walking. I'm going to follow you, Jesus, but first let me go back and take care of things with my daddy and bury him. Whether he was dead already or whether he was going to wait until he died. It seems to indicate he was going to wait till he died. The Lord kept walking. Amen. And I said, then the last one said, Lord, I, them other two guys, what a bunch of jack legs, man. I'll follow you. The Lord said, okay, good, let's go. He said, well, 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 I got some people at my house. And you know, I need to check in with them and find out if I get, this is exactly what I told them. Did I get a thumbs up? Did, did, the, did, the, did the, my friends on social media, did they go, follow Jesus? I said, now you got to remember when the Apostle Paul was called immediately, he conferred not with flesh and blood. Yeah. And I said, so then you die. Now what? Well, preacher, if I had made that decision, if you'd have made that decision, the Lord would have rewarded you for that decision because you don't know when you're going to expire. Because He knew in making that decision, you were thinking about eternity instead of the here and now. Let me help you. And He didn't know. You didn't know that was the expiration date. I said, now, here's the antithesis. Here's the opposite. If you knew you were going to go in a week, would you do something different now at invitation time than you would if you didn't know? Kids, kids are like, they're like, and when you really get kids going, look, they're not like you. They haven't been around long enough to be able to like, unemotional, like I'm disconnected. I'm in the far country right now. I'm playing ball. I'm catching a fish. I'm doing whatever. I'm... Kids aren't like that. I mean, when you capture them, before they can think, it's like an excited utterance. They can't, it's like, they're like, so you, you think you would do things different? Why is that? Because you've adapted to the theology of the far country. Well, let me hurry. Can you give me about 10 minutes? Amen. It's after 12. His funds ran out. His friends ran off. The food's gone, the famine set in, and now it's fish or cut bait. 
you got to do something. So the Bible says the first thing he did was he went and said, okay, i got to do something. Where was the first place he went? To a citizen of that country. I'll figure it out myself. I'm too proud to go back and say, Daddy, I done messed up. And the Bible said he got so hungry that he wished he could take <coughs> the husks out of that pig slop. And if you've ever been around pigs, there ain't nothing good about a pig but bacon. <laughs> but while that bacon's getting made, man, they stink. Considered an unclean animal. Oh, and he's a Jew. Oh, and he's willing to do things that were wrong for him to do in order to try to stay alive. And now his belly button's touching his backbone. The food's gone and the friends are gone and his funds are gone. And he's sitting there watching them fat pigs in slop and they ain't bothered by it at all. They're just having the time of their life. And he's slopping hogs for someone else because if you stay in Midian long enough in the far country long enough, you know what you start doing? You start making excuses for feeding their pigs. You start accepting their same-sex marriage ideas and their drinking and their drugs and their shacking up and living together and gets to be okay and then you get real offended like you just winced when I said what I did. You're just like, well, wait a minute now. Okay, you get accustomed to that. I'll carry that stuff, pig food for you. Don't even realize you're starving to death. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole story. We're running out of time. But you know what he said? I've had enough. His bush was burning. Everything he thought he left the father's house for burnt slap to the ground. Every bit of it. He didn't have a reputation. He didn't have a name. He didn't have any funds. He didn't have nothing. Moses, what's it going to cost you? Everything. He didn't bring none of that with him back to Egypt. He left it all where it was. The Lord said, it's like going to heaven. You can't take all that stuff with you. One thing to have it, it's another thing for it to have you. Stay with me. I'm about done, I promise. You know what he said? <sighs> I will arise. It means he's pretty low. Yeah. He's pretty far down. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Have you ever looked at the woman with the issue of blood? Have you ever considered that even though she heard about the great physician being in town that if she hadn't uh, got up, she'd have never got to him and she'd have never gotten help or healed. Preacher, I know what you're saying is right. Why are you sitting there? <laughs> Preacher, you know how many times I've made that same commitment? Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with anything? I will arise, he said. I'll go to my father's house. You've been thinking about it. I know when I get there, I've got to accept responsibility. Father didn't drive me off. I left on my own. <sighs> I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no more worthy to be called a son. But could I be a servant? Can I, can, I, can I earn myself? Can I, can I go to work for you, Daddy? Master, sir. Can I go to work for you? What we like is the part of the story where the father just seems to wipe the slate clean. But it doesn't really end that way. Because if the father's a just and a righteous father, 
although he gives him a robe and a ring and the shoes, he still is not where he was when he left. Because it cost him when he left. He doesn't now all of a sudden get another inheritance to be taken away from the elder brother. But that's obviously what the elder brother thought. You know what he said? I never left. I, I never left. I've been right there. Never killed no fatted calf for me. Never had a party for my friends. That tells you a lot right there. Wow, dad didn't throw you a party for your friends? Is it possible that you had the wrong friends even though you were in the father's house? Amen. Maybe that might be why daddy didn't throw you a party for your friends. But it's more than that. And the servant got it. The servant said, hey, can we make this about something other than you? Don't you see how your father who said, my kid who was once dead is alive now and it's been restored unto me. Can't you be happy just because the father's happy? Amen. And stop making it about whether or not you think he's rejoicing that the kid went prodigal. He's back. He'll never be the elder brother. He'll never supplant you. He'll never take your inheritance. But can't you be glad because the Father's glad? I'll give you this illustration and I'll close. This did not happen at this church, but it did happen at another church of a friend of mine who's gone on now. At the end of a service back there in the back corner over on the far brick wall over there, the fellow walked in, you know, and he southern drawl. Preacher, I didn't talk to you. He said, y'all had a conniption fit in here today over a fellow that had come back. And he said, yes, sir, we did. He said, that man's been out of the will of God for years and been messing up and we've been praying for him and praying for him and praying for him and praying for him. And when he came through the doors of that church today and got done preaching and he came down the aisle way, he said, yeah. And they cut a rug. I mean, they were, they were glad he was home. And his mama was pitching a fit because her boy was back in church. It's a southern thing, right? Got back in fellowship with the Lord. And that preacher told me who I believe, he was a dear friend of mine, he said he kind of hitched up his britches. He said, well, I'll have you know I'll not be a part of somebody who makes a bigger deal out of prodigals than they do out of saints who never leave. And my friend James Aloysius Lentz stood up and he said, well, goodbye and good riddance. Amen. But we'll be here for you to come back to when you are done being full of yourself. Amen. 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 You say, not Jim. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, Carolina whistle pigs. Here's the teaching but by the grace of God. The seducing spirit gives us the justifiable reason to walk away. Can't lose your salvation. He never quit being a son. You understand the illustration. But man, can we take our inheritance that God intends for us to have for eternity and give it all to the world. And the world could care less Amen. about us. Amen. Right now, they think you are whack-a-moles. Yeah. Yeah. You're nuts. You're in church on a Sunday. Even some of your family's like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, we go into church, and we go on Sunday night, and we go on Wednesday. Why, why do you do that? Well, because I'm living for something yes, sir. in eternity. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Could I ask you this question? I'm not going to play hymns for an invitation. You may not have gone to the far country. 
But here's the question. Are you thinking about it? Are you pondering it? Are you considering it? Do you, do you think you're bulletproof that never would happen to you, that you can handle it? The seducing spirit that's talking to you is enticing you, telling you what is appealing to you, is pleasurable to you. Before you heed the call and ask the Lord for your inheritance, could I make this suggestion to you? Not going to prolong it. If God spoke to you, maybe the spirit of the prodigal is talking to you about heading to the far country. Here's the sad thing. Brother Sean Brown drew me a picture of it. Because you only read of one that came back from the far country. Right outside the pigsty is a graveyard. And it contains the bones of all of those prodigals who left. But they never made it back home. I don't want your name engraved on that stone when the Lord said, now it's time to go home. I'd rather Him get you from the house in fellowship with Him than to get you from being joined to a citizen of the far country. Father, I pray You might help us to consider these matters this morning that we might just pause and understand that only by the grace of God we too can get caught up in worldly things, worldly situations, worldly circumstances. And before we know it, the far country and us have more in common than we do with the Father. I pray, Lord, that you might help us to recognize that, to grab a hold of it, that we would humble ourselves and Keep ourselves under your hand as opposed to wanting to be out running buck wild under our own hand. Bless these folks for coming, braving the situations, the circumstances that are going on around them. Protect them, Lord, and watch over them and their families. Heal up those that are among us that are sick and those that are struggling and those that are hurting. And probably, Lord, you'll be real to them during a time that is unprecedented in our lives. And help us to light the pathway from the pig pen to the prodigal father's house and encourage those prodigals to come back to the house instead of standing in their way. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.